Hey guys, today we're going to talk about Alpha Zero and Monte Carlo Tree Search. Alpha Zero was originally built to play the game of Go, a game with more valid states than there are atoms in the universe. So if we're going to have any hope of understanding what's actually going on here, we're going to need a much simpler game. And the game that we're going to look at is called Connect 2. In Connect 2, players alternate between placing pieces on the board with the goal of getting two beside one another. This is obviously super easy for the first person to play who can play in the middle and then guarantee that they're going to win. But this game is still interesting in the sense that technically it still is possible for player two to win the game. And it's also possible for us to reach draw states. Um, when the player wins the game, they receive a reward of one. The player who loses the game receives a reward of negative one and draws are given the reward of zero. So the reason we've chosen Connect 2 as the game that we're going to look at is because we can visualize the entire game tree and see exactly what's going on during Monte Carlo tree search. Um, this is the game state, the game tree for Connect 2. We start with an initially empty board. Player 1 maybe plays in the first position. Player 2 can respond in one of three ways. Player 2 can respond in, or player 1 can respond in two ways and so on. And the game just alternates between players placing their stones on the board until we reach a terminal state. In Connect 2, there are 24 terminal states. Uh, 12 of them are winning for player one, eight of them are draws, and four of them are losing. So it's pretty hard to lose this game. If we're gonna feed these states to a neural network and ask it sort of to give us suggestions on how we should play, we're gonna need to, a way to represent this game board. So we're gonna represent these four empty slots as four zeros. And anywhere we place one of our stones, we're gonna represent it with a one. And anywhere where we see our enemy stones, we're going to represent it with negative one. So the states would look something like this. There's a subtlety here that's worth, you know, pausing and taking a second to discuss. When we say we place a one or a negative one on the board, we always craft the state or we always, you know, build the state based on the perspective of who is about to play. So in this state, player one is about to play their first stone and there's nothing confusing here. It's all empty stones. But here, say player one plays in the first slot we transition to this state. You'll notice we actually have a negative one in the first slot. And that's because from player two's perspective, they've seen their enemy place a stone at this position. Once we place a stone, say, in the first available position here, you'll notice this negative one turns back into a one. And player two stone is represented as negative one. And you have this kind of toggling as we switch players. Um, the, the states are basically inverted as we transition through this. And this is done to make it easier to feed these states to our neural network. The way Alpha Zero is trained is we have it play itself a whole bunch of times, we record those states, and then we ask it how it would sort of judge um, different attributes of the, the value of this state, or what moves should we make in this state. And it's easier if we always represent state from the current player's perspective. It just ends up being easier to feed that to the neural network. So with that out of the way, there's three main components to alpha zero. And one is the value network, one is the policy network, and one is the Monte Carlo tree search. So the value network looks something like this. It accepts as input one of those game states, and as output, it represents, or it outputs just a single number. So if we're going to win in a given state with absolute certainty, we'd like to see a value of one be output from our value network. If we're going to lose with absolute certainty, we're going to have we're going to want to see negative one there. And if we're going to draw, which is the case here, there's only one slot left and it's going to lead to a draw, we want to see zero come out of here. Um, and in a game like Connect 2, we can you know, expect our value network to be very confident about ones and negative ones. Um, it's either we're going to win or lose with almost absolute certainty. But in games like Go, you're going to have, you know, values that range somewhere in between those two numbers where it's not quite sure who's going to win and who's going to lose because it's hard to say. So how do we actually train a neural network like this to give us better values? Well, as I mentioned before, we have alpha zero play itself a whole num a whole bunch of times and we record what happened at each step of the game. So a sample game has been reproduced here. We start with an initially empty board. Player one then wants to play in the first position. We transition to this state. Um, it's the same situation as before. Even though player one placed a stone here, it's now player two's turn. So they see that their enemy, their opponent has placed a stone here. 
they want to play in the third position in this game so that leads us to a state that looks like this now we're back from the perspective of player one they see their own stone here their enemy's stone at position three and they're going to play in the second position which will give them two stones in a row and give them the victory so after the final move player one is declared the winner we've been keeping track of these states and now we go through we go back through them and we mark all the states held by player one with a one and all the states held by player two with a reward of negative one so it would look something like this where you have this tuple of the state and the reward that you got at that state once we do this enough times you can you can imagine we build up like a big training set of like thousands of game states and we shuffle them all up and then we we take one of them we ask our neural network how it would value this position and it would give us something like 0 0.5 or 0 0.8 or some number and we would tell it no the actual outcome that was seen during the game was a win for player one so you should output one here and we would use something like mean squared error um, all this code is available on github for if you want to dive into the actual details but we would use something like mean squared error and um, you know normal neural network training stuff to try and push these weights to be more confident about giving us a one when they see this state. And then we would do the same thing with this state and this outcome of negative one and this state and this outcome of one. And if you do this over enough games and enough game states, you're hopefully going to have something that starts to get a sense of what is a good board and what does a bad board look like. Um, it's important to notice that there's no thinking going on here. The value network isn't doing anything that you would call intelligent really. It's not imagining how its opponent would respond to a move or, or looking ahead or anything like that. It's something more similar to image recognition. And for 2D games like Go and Chess and Shogi, uh, AlphaZero was actually built with architectures from computer vision like ResNets um, as the backbone for this value network. So it's very sim simple or so very similar to that. Next, we have the policy network. The policy network, once again, takes a game board or a game state as input, but this time it outputs a list, uh, in the case of our game, um, of four numbers. And these are called the prior pro policy, or they're called the prior probabilities given to us from the policy network. And they suggest how confident Alpha Zero is that this would be like a good move. So it says with 88% certainty that we should play here, with 10% certainty we should play here, and strangely enough, with 1% certainty that we should play in each of these invalid positions. And this is something to keep in mind. Um, alpha zero, or not alpha zero necessarily, but the policy network isn't going to give you zero outputs for invalid moves. So we actually have to use the game. We have to query the game for what is a valid move, what is an invalid move, and then we have to mask out any invalid moves from our prior policy here. Um, and then we would probably renormalize the, the probabilities so they still add up to one. So how do we train the policy network? This was sort of an interesting thing and it's a lot different than sort of what I was thinking. The value network made sense to me. This one was a little less intuitive. The way that we train our policy network is to try and encourage it to be exactly the same as Monte Carlo tree search. So we haven't talked about Monte Carlo tree search yet, but Monte Carlo tree search looks ahead. It considers the board from the perspective of its opponent. It does simulations and it comes up with a set of pop prior, like uh, I shouldn't call them priors, a set of probabilities that are usually better than the ones given to us from our policy network, who is only looking at a single game board. Um, and what we try and do is we try to encourage our policy network to output probabilities that are very similar to what the Monte Carlo tree search would have output for this given state. So how do we do that? Um, if we look at the exact same game that we played before, what we do is we keep track of the game state, but we also keep track of what the Monte Carlo tree search suggested we do at each position. So in this game state, we had an empty board. Monte Carlo tree search told us with 40% certainty we should play in the second position, 40% certainty we should play in the third position, and 10% for the other positions here. We would ask our policy network, how does it judge this? And then we would use cross entropy loss to take whatever it output and try and make it more similar to what the Monte Carlo tree search said for that given state. Um, the Monte Carlo tree search sort of 
is kind of this interesting circular dependency. We, we're trying to train our policy network to be closer to the Monte Carlo tree search and the Monte Carlo tree search in turn uses the policy network to try and judge which are, which positions look promising to explore. And you kind of have this thing where you improve the policy network, which improves the Monte Carlo tree search, which improves the policy network and so on. And it just sort of keeps improving, you would hope. Um, and that's how we train our policy network. So the next thing to look at is Monte Carlo tree search. But just before we do that, we're going to look at the class node that contains all the information about these nodes in our search tree. So we can better understand maybe a bit about how Monte Carlo tree search builds up its own search tree and traverses it. So the node class looks something like this. It accepts a prior, and this is the prior probability of selecting this state from its parent, which is kind of like a lot of words and kind of confusing to me at least. Um, but basically what that means is if you have a state like this, that said there's 88% chance of taking this, this state or 10% chance of taking this state, the child over here that would, would be represented by taking this state would have a prior of 88%. So it comes from the policy network run against the parent of the given node which is a little confusing, um, but that's what they, that's what we're explaining here. The prior probability of selecting this state from its parent. Next, we keep track of whose turn it is to play um, one or negative one. That's how we represent players in this, not one and two, uh, but current player and opponent. And then we have um, all the children, legal children that you can reach from this stage um, or from this state. We keep track of the total number of times this node was visited during Monte Carlo tree search, and we keep that in this visit count here. Uh, this ends up being really important. Uh, the way we actually select what is a good move or a bad move after we've done all our Monte Carlo tree search and we've run all our simulations is we look at the visit count of the nodes available from the root of the tree. And that the ones with the highest visit count are good moves. And those are the ones that we end up taking uh, if we're playing sort of greedily in competitive play or something like that. We also keep track of a value sum, which is a sum of the values from this state and all of its children states every time they get visited. So it's not like a persistent value, but like every time we do a Monte Carlo tree search simulation, we find a root node and then we get a value for that root node and we add that value all the way back up the tree um, in whatever path we took to get to that leaf node. And we'll see a little bit more about that um, when we look at the visualization here in a second. Next, we keep track of the state. This is the normal board state that we've been looking at, the zeros, ones, and negative ones. Finally, we have a method here that just takes the value sum, divides it by the visit count, which basically uh, normalizes it and gives us like an average value for this given node. All right, so now we're ready to discuss Monte Carlo tree search. First, we'll look at it sort of from a high level. So this Monte Carlo tree search run method accepts a state, that's the current state of the game, um, the player who's ready to play, player one or negative one, and the number of Monte Carlo tree search simulations that we'd like to make. When playing Go, Alpha Zero was making, I believe, 1,600 of such simulations. So this all runs, and we'll just speed through it really quickly here to see at the very end, we return the root. So this is the root of a game tree that we've built up. And this root has some interesting properties on it. If we look at the child of, or the children of this root, the first child has a visit count of two, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. The best action to take, according to this Monte Carlo tree search, was to take the very first action because it has the highest visit count. So whoever calls this method, if they're playing in competitive play, they will greedily select that action, play that, and the game will continue. Now let's break down sort of what's going actually going on during Monte Carlo tree search. So to start, we initialize an empty node, root node. It has um, no useful information in it, but we immediately do what's called expanding the root. So we expand it, we get give it a state, and we find out what actions are valid in this move and what the neural network, what the policy network says the prior probability is that we should take each of these actions. So in this case, we fix the prior probabilities 
for our policy network to always output equal probabilities for every move that is given. And we've also fixed the value network to always output 0.5 for any state that it sees. And this is just to simplify things a little bit while we explore Monte Carlo tree search. So in this case, the prior for each one of these nodes is 0.25. In an ideal situation, you'd have a very confident neural network that would say, maybe this move should be made with 80% probability, this one with 10% um, and the other two with five or something like that. And then you would sort of guide your exploration um, that way. So after we expand the root node, we start the sort of core process of Monte Carlo tree search, and that's running these five simulations. And the goal during each simulation is to traverse to some leaf node in the tree, right now there's four, and expand that leaf node, find what the neural network values at that leaf node, or if the game's ended at that leaf node, that's also a possibility, and back, back up the value up the tree that we find at that leaf node. Um, the idea being the value of the child should have some influence on the value of the parent state and that parent's parent and so on, all the way back up to the root of the tree. So the more we explore, the more we know about the game tree. So while we try to traverse to this one of these leaf nodes, um, we, we keep track of the current node that we're on and a path of all the nodes we've seen and we check whether this node is expanded. We're currently on the root node. It has been expanded once. We did that right at the start. So we select a child node. The way that we select a child node is we take the child with the highest upper confidence bound score or UCB score. We haven't talked about UCB score yet, but UCB score depends on the prior value or so the prior, like the prior probability for a state the value of that state and the number of times that we've already visited that state relative to its parent. And we'll get into that in the, the next slide. But for now, just know that we have some score called UCB score and we always greedily select the child with the best UCB score. In the case of a tie, as is the case here, we just take the first one. But you can change your implementation to take the second one or a random one or something like that. It's actually pretty rare that you would see uh, a true tie like this. So we append this node to, um, we append it to our search path to keep track of the fact that we visited to state zero here. That's what this uh, zero represents, taking action zero. And then we check, is this node expanded? No, it is not. So we break out, we get the parent of this node and its state. We actually ask the game, okay, in this parent state, if I take the given action zero, what state does that lead to? And it says, well, you would put a one here and there would be zeros in the other positions. Next, we take the board from the perspective of our opponent. So we invert it. Um, we check whether or not the game has ended here by asking the game, is there a reward available for reaching this state? The game tells us, no, there is no reward. So we then expand this node. And when we expand it, we can see here all the prior probabilities of its children are also equal 0 0.33 for each one uh, with no values. The value that got returned for this state here was 0 0.5. So now we're about to back up that value, back up the tree. Um, this one gets a value of 0.5. This one gets a, uh, the opposite value because what's worth 0 0.5 to my opponent is worth negative 0 0.5 to me. Um, and that's how we, we sort of run one single simulation of Monte Carlo tree search. So we'll just continue this. We do the same thing. We select a child. Uh, it's possible that you might select a, this child if like say this value was super good or something like that or a super interesting value to uh, explore or we hadn't visited it yet or it had a very high prior or something like that. But in this case, since all children of the root node are equal, we're actually just gonna select the next one and expand that, back up its value, select the next one back up its value, select the next one, back up its value. Great, so now we're on our fifth and final simulation. And in this simulation, we start in the root, we initialize our search path with just the root, we start looking again. We've now visited all of these one time, they're all back to being equal, so we're going to end up taking the very first action here. But this node has been expanded, so now we have to decide which of its children we'd like to visit. Once again, we use UCB score to calculate this, take the best one 
with the highest UCB score, but they're all ties in this case, so we end up taking the first one. That's great. We get the parent node of this state, the negative one zero zero. We ask the game, okay, well, if we play in the first available position here, what does the game look like? Uh, get the game from our opponent's perspective. Is there a reward for this state? No, there is not. It's still not a terminal state. And then finally, well, what does the neural network say the value of this state is then? And it's 0 0.5 because we've just fixed that. Next, we back this up the whole tree, just like this. Um, I guess one interesting thing is the 0 0.5 here gets sort of canceled out by the negative 0 0.5 um, and just continues up the tree like that until we get negative 0 0.3 for our initial root state. Uh, these values almost don't matter since they're all fixed at 0 0.5. They don't really mean much right now. Um, but ideally, you would have values that actually mattered from a strong value network, or you would reach a terminal state and get the true value according to the game for that state, and you would back that value up the tree. Finally, we return the root. So like I said at the start, since this child had the highest visit count, this is technically the best action to take. If we're training, we might just use these visit counts to create a probability distribution that we'd sample from that would make this one, say, twice as likely as this one to be selected, but not 100% always going to be selected. And that's basically the introduction to Monte Carlo tree search. The way you'll hear a lot of people talk about it is there's three stages. There's a select stage where we try and get to a root node an expand stage where we expand that root node and a backup stage where we back up the value that we found in that root node all the way back up the tree. And this is what the code would look like um, for one of those Monte Carlo tree searches. So one thing I wanted to tell you about before we're done is just quickly talk about the UCB score. The UCB score, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a score. It's a math, it's a math function that they came up that seems to work well. Um, but I wouldn't get too hung up on like, why is it a square root or why do we do, you know, why do we value these ones together? I would just sort of try and understand it from the perspective of what does the UC UCB score take into account? And it takes into account three things. The child's prior value, so how likely this child was to be success selected according to the policy network. How many times this child and parent, well, how many times this child has been visited relative to its parents? And then finally, the value of this state. So it takes into account the prior, the value, and the number of times we visited it. It adds these things up into a final score. And then during the selection stage of Monte Carlo Tree Search, we uh, just take the path with the highest UCB score. And the more we visit a path, the more this count will go up and sort of make this prior score part smaller. So if you visit one place too many times, um, eventually the UCB score will start to fall and we will visit other places in the tree and we'll get some exploration that way. And that's my introduction to Monte Carlo Tree Search. Uh, all the code will be available on GitHub. I also have an accompanying blog post where you can play around with this uh, simulation. And let me know if you have any questions below and I'll uh, try to answer them as best I can. Thanks for stopping by guys. Bye now.